these are the things that actually have been digitized and are currently available in Minnesota Reflections if you'd like to check them out. And some of them are from this past phase year, phase 15, some are from phase 14, and a few from maybe a little bit earlier. But as you can see, we have a number of new contributors, including the Museum of Lake Minnetonka, um, the University of Minnesota Immigration History Research Center Archives, and they are represented today. Redwood Falls Public Library, who I mentioned earlier, and uh, the Marshall County Historical Society. So again, some highlights of these collections are more oral histories, a number of blueprints and architectural drawings, um, a World War I service record for an entire county. That's actually from Marshall County Historical Society. Um, and that's something where this is such a unique thing. They basically, the, t the county basically kept a scrapbook of everyone that was involved in World War I. And they kept their service records, their letters, a number of information. And, and usually we don't take projects that are just one item, but this was so unique and unusual that we said, yes, yes, please. You know, we'd like to have this, we'd like to share this. This is really fabulous. Um, we also have um, many historic photographs, which are a lot of fun. So um, here are some highlights of some of the things that we have added. As I said, there's a number of kind of architectural drawings of buildings, of boats. Um, there's local businesses, the library. There's that uh, gazette, gazetteer I mentioned from Nobles County that has all the local information. We have pictures. I, I love the ladies. Um, they're the officers of the uh, Women's Cooperative Guild up in Virginia, Minnesota, but I love how they look very much of their era, for example. Um, and then there's some souvenir books from Redwood Falls. So when you, when you send these things and you commit, uh, share them with Minnesota Reflections, as we're saying, we like to increase your visibility and make more people aware of what you have. And one of my favorite ways to do this is through um, the item of the week feature I do every Monday and sometimes Tuesday on uh, social media. So um, we, get, we do that every week uh, throughout the year. And I usually try and tie those to something that's going on, either date related that week or something that's in the news at the time. So um, I wanted to share with you some of the, the ones that got the most uh, most reaction uh, this past year since, uh, so this is from since June of 2018. So this is an honorable mention. I was just going to give you the top five, but then I noticed that this one was just out of the top five at number six. It was the Wandagog House, um, that's New Ulm, and it got 522 view, 524, excuse me, views through our social media, and it was, um, shared, I, I put it out for Wanda Gog's birthday, and she, of course, continues to be a very popular author. But why I wanted to share this was, again, is this is the only thing that the Wanda Gog House Association has shared with us. It's the one item they have. <laughs> but look, it, got, it was our sixth most viewed thing of the whole year, and I have been in contact with people at the association that like to contribute more. But you know, just to show that even if you have a very small collection, it still can make a great impact. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of fun. So the fifth most popular thing um, in our item of the week this year was actually, this is one, sometimes the item of the week sort of surprises me. Sometimes I think, oh yeah, this is going to be a popular one. Popular one. This one kind of like, huh, okay. I had to go back and look about why even I had posted it. But it's, it's drilling a well in Worthington. And this was actually in honor of when electricity came to Worthington, Minnesota. And, and this well, uh, this water plant actually helped, it was the water plant first and then the electricity came along with the water plant through the power that was generated there. And um, I posted it just before Christmas and I made some comment about, oh, just in time for holiday lights. And I don't know if that added to the popularity of this post or not, but it was kind of fun. So this number four with 751 views was, um, I put this up in honor of uh, Thank a Mail Carrier day. <laughs> so, and I said something about, you know, how, how the links that people would go to to deliver the mail. So we got a lot of um, reactions to people like, you know, and then people saying, oh yeah, I remember, you know, this, there, I have this picture from my county or, you know, so that was a lot of fun too. Um, this was posted in honor of, there was a huge snowstorm in southern Minnesota that week. Enormous. People couldn't drive anywhere. People were, so I said, some things just don't change. You know, 100 years ago, <laughs> look, there's huge snowstorms in Mankato. So <laughs> that got 831 views because people definitely could identify with what was going on. Our second most popular one, and this one is somewhat tongue in cheek, um, I posted this for No Shave November. Because <laughs> I thought this was a really epic beard, and luckily the Methodists were really good sports about it. <laughs> they thought it was funny. So, but obviously, it res again, it resonated with a lot of people with 943 views. So, and yeah, I mean, you gotta memorialize Chauncey and his beard. So, um, so 943. You can see we're kind of inching up with the views. But number one, does anyone have any thoughts about what number one might be? Because I will tell, it's it was a very popular post this year. It's actually from the Pope County Historical Society. <laughs> They're here today too. It is a poster from the Lakeside Ballroom, and you can see it got almost 6,700 views. <laughs> Woohoo! 
<laughs> it's by far the most popular thing I posted all year. <laughs> yes, and you want to. <laughs> And, and, and the Pope County Historical Society shared a number of these posters with us. And I will have to admit, I picked one where I thought, there, you know, you see that Bobby V's backing band, The Shadows, was on here. So I purposely tried to choose one that was a little more well-known, thinking that would generate interest. But beyond that, what actually happened is that it really engendered a community conversation. Like, people were posting all over our, our Facebook page saying how much they enjoyed going there as a teenager. And remember this concert, remember that concert. And, oh, gosh, I loved going to the Lakeside Ballroom. And, it was, and they were tagging each other. And it was really, it was really great. You know, to see that happen, that's kind of what you want to see, see happen when you post these things out there. So it was really, really fun to have that happen this year. So see, maybe next year your things will be up, up in our, our top five. And thanks again, Anne. <laughs> so now I'm going to hand it back to Greta to talk another way about we can make your collections more visible. So this is a project that I've talked about a lot, and I'm assuming a lot of you are familiar with the Minnesota Digital Library Primary Source Set Project. Um, but in case you're not, um, these are curated sets of primary source materials based around a specific Minnesota topic, and um, they're designed to help students and teach, designed to help students develop critical thinking skills, um, and also to help teachers use primary source material in the classroom with greater confidence. Um, and, for, and from your perspective, it's also a great opportunity to showcase content. Um, from your collection in a new and innovative way. So, um, so this project was launched a few years ago, and um, I should also mention this is our first foray into digital storytelling, and um, this is also a great opportunity for you if you're interested in getting involved. Um, I have a whole program for guest authors, and if any one of you would like to write a primary source set on a topic, that is of interest to you and which we have content in, in Minnesota Reflections, that is an important part of this. Um, we have to have content. Um, I would love to hear from you and you're welcome to contact me and um, we can develop a project together. Okay, so you might else be wondering what we can else, what, what are the other things that Molly and I can't do and one of the things that we can't do is we can't help you drive a locomotive. Um, and we can't help you bake 24 pies at once, like these lovely ladies are doing right here. And we can't hold your horses and your mules, but, um, or, or maybe we could, but we're not going to, so. <laughs> but we can help you describe your collection. And um, so to talk a little bit about more about that, I'm gonna talk briefly about metadata with the Minnesota Digital Library. Um, I'm sure all of you, at one point or another, have gone through metadata training with either myself or Molly. And so you're probably familiar with this image of the Minnesota Digital Library metadata guidelines. But this is just a helpful reminder to um, let you know that the updated version of the guidelines is always available online at the Minnesota Digital Library website. Um, and, and that it has been updated um, earlier this year where I added more examples and um, so, um, and there is that new section on the rights work, um, including terms and definitions and a quick reference guide. And, um, and then I also update it to include new physical formats. So, um, so just remember, this is always available to you as a reference. Um, like I said, it's a PDF that's available online that you can use online or you can print it out. And um, always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. So, and that kind of is a good segue into the next session. I also want to remind all of you about the training opportunities that exist with us. Um, whenever you do a project with you, with us, I am here to help you with your metadata creation. Um, I'm also available for what I call metadata refresher trainings. So um, if it's been a little while since you've done a project, it's good to kind of jump back in and have a little refresher. Um, and that might be one aspect of metadata creation or just a quick overview review. And I can meet with you in person or we can set something up remotely. And always remember you can contact me with any questions, problems, or concerns. So now, back to Molly, and she's gonna give you a little bit more detail on a project that we have both been involved with, so. Mm -hmm. So, 
you know we've been working on rights because we mention it fairly often. Um, but you know, these rights statements are really another way to describe your collection. They're a way to get more information about your collection out there and to help users. I mean, that's a really big part of, of why we do this. So it's additional data that then can, can help people out. So as many of you know, we completed the pilot project um, last June, so kind of right, right around this time last year. And thank you again to our pilot project participants, many of whom are here today. We really appreciate all the work that you put in on that. Since then, um, since the completion of that project, and we did a lot of evaluation after that project, trying to think about how we wanted to roll this out more broadly going forward. We have also been doing a lot of communicating outward about the work we did. So um, I and other MDL staff have been traveling um, around, and, and pilot project uh, participants have been traveling around not only Minnesota, but also the larger region, um, and making presentations about our work, including the Minnesota Library Association Conference, the Minnesota Alliance of Local History Museums Conference, the South Dakota Library Association Conference, uh, Will's Peer Council in Wisconsin, and DPLA Fest in Chicago. So we really have been trying to get the word out broadly. Um, uh, also, uh, Nancy Sims from the University of Minnesota and, my, and me did a full training workshop at the Upper Midwest Digital Collections Conference, which was held in St. Paul at St. Kate's in uh, November. So that would number of people participated in that. Um, to keep up with our promise to have all new materials coming into Minnesota Reflections from Phase 15 onwards to have to, to have standardized rights statements applied. Greta and I have also been doing individualized trainings as part of metadata um, to get people up to speed on rights statements and how they might be applied to those parts of their collections. So um, to assist in all these educational efforts and in, in the training, um, tra and in, as we're planning for training, we've developed a number of materials and implementation tools that I'll now give you examples of. Um, first of all, though, I did want to show you how it actually looks when it's implemented in Minnesota Reflection. So this is one of our participants, um, the Northfield Historical Society. So you can see this is a screenshots from their actual, an actual record. And you can see it's got the, um, the logo right there the, for the in copyright symbol, excuse me. And it has the statement about what in copyright, what that entails, and it has the stable URI. So we have different data points throughout the record that convey this rights information. So to get there, you may have seen at the check-in table, we had some handouts that you could choose if you wanted to. Um, our team developed a uh, rights, rights decision workflow, which, um, which we kind of tested out with the pilot project, but we discovered what are the questions you really need to ask as you're thinking about applying rights statements. We boiled it down into this decision tree. So there are three basic questions. Is it published? Is it unpublished? Is it a government document? And then there's a number of set questions you get answer from there that gets you to either a pretty good determination or knowing that you need to do more work. So that is something that we uh, published back in October and is widely available and again is here today as a handout if you'd like one. We also created a, our team created a right statements quick reference guide which I know many of you grabbed. Um, this is uh, put into three, the three main categories um, that those three uh, logos I showed you earlier in copyright no copyright and other which kind of actually matches up to in copyright is when when someone else owns the rights, when someone owns the rights, um, no copyright is when no one owns the rights, and other is when you're unsure about the rights. So we, we assorted that into things that are sort of easier categories to use, and again, use the, 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 the title, the description, and then we also added a sort of a should you use section, like you know, this, is where you, this is an instance where you might want to use this or you might not, you might want to use caution with this one. And although there are 12 right statements, we boiled it down to six because those are the ones that we found that most people that, most of the collections we work with, pretty much all our contributors in similar collections, we really only use those six. Because the other ones mostly have to deal with contractual obligations and a lot of us don't, don't have those. We also created a set of two training videos. Um, it's a two-part series um, that covers the key information you need to get started if you're interested in rights implementation. The first provides an overview of why, why it's important to do this work and an introduction to the six statements, which again is kind of covered on that handout, but we talk it through. And then the second part um, gives actual examples. We work through actual examples illustrating each statement that might apply and we use um, real things from Minnesota Reflection. So it's very direct and hands-on. So going forward, we really like people who are going to be doing rights training, whether in phase 16, et cetera, to view these ahead of time so you have a chance to get familiar with the concepts before, before we come together. And where might I find these things, you may ask? <laughs> we 
created a whole new section on the mindigital.org webpage under the standard and standards and best practices section, and it's called rights resources, and the, the, web, the web address is right there. Um, so all these things are there. There's an overview of the project. There's an overview of rights statements. There's links to our handouts. There's also links to the newly enhanced rights section of Greta's metadata guidelines, and the videos are on there too. So everything you need is in this one-stop shop if you need to connect with it. We are also going to be holding some open rights implementation workshops later this summer. Um, these are open to whoever would be interested in undergoing rights training with us. Um, you don't have to be a contributor. You don't even have to be you know, actively starting a project. If you just want to learn more, you're welcome to come. Um, so we're going to be holding one um, at the Washburn Public Library in Minneapolis on July 22nd, and then another up in Duluth on August 15th on um, at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And again, these are open to everyone. They're meant to be regional meetings. You don't have to be from Duluth or from Minneapolis to come, just, just come. Um, and we will provide lunch. And if you want to, if you are a contributor who really wants to get going on the implementation, we are gonna do general training in the morning. And then um, kind of based off the workshop we did at Upper Midwest Digital Collections Conference with lots of examples and lots of hands-on work. And then in the afternoon, um, if you are a contributor and you are interested, we'll actually work with you in a hands-on workshop way to get right statesmen implemented. So we can make your spreadsheets available to you and we can actually work on the metadata in the afternoon. So that's, that's something we hope to be doing more of these in the fall. But these are fall and into 2020. But these are the first two we've got on our calendar. So hope to see many of you there. So kind of to wrap this up, we, we can't help you change a tire on your 1913 Overland Touring car, but Greta and I can help you with a lot of things, and we really like to, and so thank you for, thank you for working with us, and we're always happy to help. We were asked, are we only using the six versus, um, you know, there's 12 right statements, but are we really limited to just the six? And at this point, um, I think, we are really promoting the six because after Molly and I and Nancy and Sarah Ring have evaluated the statements, these are the ones that best match our collection in terms of its content, the, the age of our materials, the types of materials that we have. And some of the statements that we have elected not to use fall into kind of vague kind of determinations that don't really help users understand content. And I don't know, Molly, if you want to add anything in there. Well, and a lot of them have to do with contractual restrictions, yes. as I mentioned, um, which many of our, you know, many of the collections don't have. So it's like, you know, it's no copyright, but for some reason it's contractually restricted that you can't use it. Um, if you thought that the thing, we, we, for Minnesota Reflections, we have created a drop-down menu allowing you really just to choose those six. Plus, we are giving people the option of choosing Creative Commons statements if those do apply to their collections. So there is that option. You know, Creative Commons being different than a right statement, being that a right statement is a descriptive label. And a Creative Commons is a license. So you're actually licensing something. So when you, if you say something's in copyright using a right statement, you're just describing it. It's, you're not saying anything that anyone can do with it. Creative Commons, you're actually saying, I hold the copyright and I say you can use this this way. So if you are the copyright holder and you'd like to license it that way, we do allow for that. If for some reason, as you're working through your collection and you thought you had something that wasn't covered under the six, I'm sure we could talk about that because, I mean, we're still in the very um, early stages of this project, so, you know, we made our best guess at it and what we've done from the work so far, but there's still room to talk and figure things out. If that's not a fit, then we need to make some changes. 